when you see the People's Bank of China buying gold. They're not buying gold, they're selling dollars. That's the way to look at it. Uh, and it's not just them, it's the whole of Asia doing exactly the same. And the word is out throughout Asia. The dollar is in trouble. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for October 28th through November 4th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we feature gold half-ounce backdated Canadian maples at just $110 over melt. We also have backdated silver one-ounce Britannia at just $2.99 over spot per ounce. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. This is an important announcement for all Liberty and Finance viewers and subscribers ahead of Election Day, Tuesday, November 5th in the U.S., and that is we will be posting our Election Day interview on a matinee time period of noon Eastern, that's 9 p.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, on Election Day, and not in our usual uh, evening time slot uh, during the election so that everyone can uh, be able to watch election coverage and have already seen our earlier video here on Liberty and Finance. That'll be noon Eastern. 9 a.m. Pacific on tomorrow, Tuesday, the 5th of November, Election Day. Take care. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this distinguished returning guest, Alistair McLeod, a former bank director, also the head of research at goldmoney.com, and also the founder of McLeod Finance, joins us here this Monday, November 4th, 2024. Alistair, thank you for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance. That's my pleasure, DK. I want to remind everyone that it was you who coined the moniker DK and it's really stuck. So congratulations for that. <laughs> but uh, we wanted to get your take on something that you've warned us about for a couple of weeks at least, and then just wrote about again today. And that's the vulnerability of the equity markets. That's the stock markets to what we observe are rising bond yields, despite interest rate cut actions and talk by the Fed. Can you tell us why this is dangerous for the stock markets at this time? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, over the decades, I've observed that um, there is a definite relationship between uh, equity markets and bond yields. <clears throat> and, um, you know, quite obviously, um, if, let us say, bond yields are high, then on a valuation basis, um, equities are expensive unless they unless their values fall. Um, it's really quite simple um, return, if you like, on 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 your investment by one means or another. Um, but equities, when you have a bull market in equities, inevitably um, it gets to a point where um, the bull market, if you like is getting tired. The participants tend to be the wrong sort of participants. They are the general public who have just got back in on onto equities because they have been rising. They don't understand why. Um, they are, you know, they will buy something that has already risen, basically. Uh, and um, uh, at that stage of the credit cycle, bond yields are already rising. Now, um, what I have observed over the decades is that the first rise in bond yields tends not to upset the equity markets because the equity markets at that stage are being driven by momentum rather than value. Uh, however, um, when you get a pause, of course, then that momentum in equities continues and um, you know it can very often translate into a bubble. But when bond yields start rising for the second time, that's the point where the equity markets really begin to fall. And uh, we've had um, a rise in bond yields. I know it's only 60 basis points on the um, US treasuries, 10-year treasuries, long bond, whatever, um, since um, sort of mid-September. Um, but i I um, have, um, I, I mean, I'm convinced that this this rise is something that is going to continue, and the reason for that is uh, because there is a debt trap which uh, the U.S. government faces, and I don't care which um, presidential candidate wins this election. Uh, I mean, they're both um, uh, uh, promised, if you like, uh, to spend 
uh, and increase the deficit, presumably before it will fall because the economy will recover or whatever dreams they may have about the future. Um, but a rising deficit at this stage is going to be uh, very, very difficult to fund, and it's going to mean rising bond yields. It's actually as simple as that. So this is the second iteration of rising bond yields. We've had the first, and the equity markets managed, if you like, to continue to, with their momentum through the first. Through the second, history repeats itself, or rhymes, however you like to put it, the second iteration of bond, right, bond yields rising, that will upset equities. And I believe that the fall in equities actually could be very, very serious. Now, the reason I say that is that if you look at the valuation gap between um, uh, bond yields and equities, they are actually standing at an all-time record, far higher, almost twice as high as they were uh, during the dot-com bubble, which really means that the equity market is is so far adrift from where it should be. Um, oh, it means that, if you like, there's a very high risk of a very, very sudden and nasty collapse. Uh, so this is something you've got to be aware of. Um, and it's. I think, um, if you like putting it very, very simply, is part of my argument for getting out of credit. I mean, you think that equities give you protection against a little bit of inflation or whatever. I mean, well, sometimes yes, but sometimes it's extremely dangerous. I mean, I do remember in the inflationary times in the 1970s, um, stock markets uh, performed extremely badly. Uh, so the idea that you get protection by being in equities um, uh, in those times, and those times are back again, uh, I would argue, um, it's, it's completely fallacious. This uh, mechanism that you're talking about, about uh, rising bond yields uh, causing uh, out a uh, capital flight from the equities market. Can you can you dig into what is driving the rising bond yields? Because it's not obvious to many casual observers on the face if the if the Fed cuts short term interest rates, why we're seeing the ten year and the thirty year rise. Uh, usually, that would correlate with rising yields would correlate with sell offs in the actual bonds themselves. You've ta you've warned us in the past that foreign holders are the first to wake up about distressed currencies and that sort of thing. Is that what you're seeing here or, or what? who's selling the bond or who's not buying the bond that would have in the past? Yes, it's, it's, it's really, um, at the end of the day, if you're going to sell bonds, uh, the value um, which uh, they will have depends really on the willingness of buyers to buy them. And, um, uh, you know, foreigners are definitely not stepping up to the plate. No. Uh, the reason that bond yields are where they are is there's an assumption that foreigners will step up to the plate. Now, admittedly, what's happened in recent um, uh, years is that all the funding has been done basically on, on short term because uh, you know banks in particular don't want duration risk. I mean, you know, we've all seen what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, for example. So, um, you know, banks aren't interested in duration risk. So where is the funding? The funding is going into U.S. Treasuries, money funds, um, you you know, and banks are just buying. Um, sorry, not U.S. Treasuries, T-bills. Uh, you know, the sort of three months, six month, maybe as far as a year, um, but any more than that. And there's you know, the only buyers out there are um, some pension funds and some insurance companies who have to have it for actuarial purposes, uh, but you know. That's pretty limited. It really is. And if you look at it from the point of view of U.S. institutions, I mean, they can see this danger too. And so they're not really in the market going out along the yield curve. And that's why the Treasury isn't isn't selling very much um, longer term debt. You know, I mean, they did because there's no demand for it. And um, if anything, the foreigners are turning net sellers. I mean, particularly the two largest holders, who are the Chinese and the Japanese, or the Japanese are the largest, followed by the Chinese. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, okay, friends of America, like, um, you know, the UK and uh, um, I suppose the Cayman Islands. Yeah, and Ireland and all those all those big buyers. Yeah, yeah they, they, you know, they, they'll sort of pick up a few pieces, but it's not enough. And, um, you know... For some reason, people seem to think that monetary policy 
uh, by the Fed actually drives the whole U, U curve. It doesn't, um, because credit is like anything else. It's a market. I mean, you know, if you have um, uh, too much debt for and not, not enough demand for it, what happens? Interest rates have to rise. The yields have to rise in order to clear it. And that's basically what we're going to be seeing. Uh, um, I mean, put it from the point of view of, of um, foreigners in particular. I mean, they can see the debt trap. And as I've said before, uh, you know, when, when you see the People's Bank of China buying gold, they're not buying gold, they're selling dollars. That's the way to look at it. Uh, and it's not just them, it's the whole of Asia doing exactly the same. And the word is out throughout Asia uh, um, that, uh, you know, that the dollar is in trouble. I mean, it's it's not really driven uh, so much by um, de-dollarization because that's really relatively minimal. Uh, it's more a question of uh, U.S. government finances. There just is not the demand for the amount of uh, debt being printed, if you like. And worse than that, because the U.S. government is printing short-term debt, it's in effect financing uh, the deficit by cash. That's the equivalent of it, you know, when you're, when you're funding it almost exclusively through the T-bills. Not, it's not good. It really is not. And so if you're going to get rising bond yields, um, you know, what does that do to equities? It collapses them because this is the second time round. We've had the first rise, which, you know, we can sort of say, well, you know, we, we didn't really expect it. But on the other hand, it hasn't really sort of undermined um, the fundamentals, if you like, of corporate America. Uh, well, it did actually, but you know, do, do, do you see what I mean? I mean, you can sort of take a bit of, um, you can tolerate a little bit of a, a, a rise in interest rates, but um, just you know, I, I repeat this every, virtually every interview I do. I mean, I remember the nineteen seventies when we had gilt yields in a similar situation with less of. Um, uh, a, a debt to GDP ratio. I mean, our debt to GDP ratio it was something like 50, 60%. Um, we had a crisis and it led to um, a requirement uh, to fund um, on 15, 15 and a quarter, and 15 and a half percent coupons. You know, this is, and, and the interest rates that went along with it were a, a similar level. In fact, I think there was slightly more. So you can see that. Um, I, you know what? We are really only in the beginning of a rise in interest rates and bond yields. Why? Because of the funding problem. And then I'll ask another question, just to sort of ram the point home. Uh, the um, debt ceiling is due to be agreed on the third of January. Uh, what's it going to be? I mean, if I was the incoming president, and by then that we will know who the incoming president is, I think I'd be angling for at least 40 trillion. What's that going to do? You know, it's not going to exactly cheer up foreign creditors, that's for sure. So that's going to be a real bone of contention, I reckon. Now, you mentioned uh, in passing that this has been a historical pattern we've seen where a second rise in uh, bond yields has, been, has spelled trouble for the stock markets. Now, can we talk about the impacts of that on ordinary uh, investors' nest eggs, their retirement savings? Uh, you mentioned insurance companies, you mentioned uh, hedge funds, man money market funds. All of these investors who, uh, either at the retail level or at the institutional level, have been benefiting from and counting on ever-rising equities markets and a strong uh, bond market. And now we're seeing both of those struggling, or you're anticipating that the struggles in the bond market will spill over and uh, pull down the house of cards of the, of the stock markets. What is that? What is the impact of that likely to be on typical insurance companies, hedge funds, money market accounts, that sort of thing that have been depending on those, uh, those upward bound markets in this falling interest rate environment for the past 40 years? Well, th 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 there are two levels of this. I mean, the obvious one is that, um, you know, valuations of uh, portfolios are just going to be, um, you know, they're really going to suffer very, very badly. Um, and uh, But the other level of it, of course, is that um, along with commercial real estate, 
along with residential property, equities uh, form the collateral for the entire financial system. And um, when you get a collapse in these values, as we saw with uh, Wall Street in 1930 to 32, you get a collapse in those values, it undermines the banking system. So uh, these asset values are actually central to the entire financial system. And as they collapse in value, the threat to the entire financial system is going to be tremendous. And it's difficult to see how banks um, will be able to, uh, if you like, weather this, particularly since they are operationally highly leveraged. Um, you know, I, th I think I, I haven't looked at it recently, but last time I looked, the leverage in the US banking system was the order of about 14 times. I'm looking at assets to core equity. Um, now, normally, that would be in the order of maybe eight to 10 times. Um, I have to say that the Japanese banking system and also the Eurozone banking system is in a far more leveraged, uh, highly leveraged situation, There's certainly in the GSIPs. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, a collapse in the stock market, I think, um, and the knock-on effects um, will threaten the entire financial system. So this is... This is all part of, if you like, why you should just get out of credit. I mean, this, that's my view anyway. Okay, help me from the cheap seats here. If, if a bank is leveraged 14 to 1, uh, would, would not a 8% or 10% decline in what they're counting as their, as their equity then basically wipe out their entire uh, balance of, of, uh, of funds and put, make them insolvent? It, it, exactly. It, it, that's, the whole, that's the whole point. I mean... Um, the thing about um, banks are dealers in credit, and their, their their balance sheets are leveraged, if you like, on equity. And it's it's wonderful if you've got, let us say, um, you know, a two percent margin when you take in, into account all the costs and all the rest of it between what you lend out and uh, what your depositors get. Um, two percent, fine. Gear it up five times. That's ten percent. Gear it up ten times. You know, that's uh, twenty percent. I mean, they're trying to get something like 25% return on equity or maybe even more through this leverage. You can see how they get to that point, if you like. Um, you know, as the economic conditions appear to improve, then they increase their leverage. The other thing that has happened this time round is that as uh, the central banks have reduced interest rates to the zero bound or indeed into negative rates, what it's done is it's compressed the bank's lending margins, the difference between, you know, um, the asset returns on assets, which are loans up to whoever, and um, uh, what they give their depositors, if anything. And th that, that squeeze in the margins, uh, their response has been to increase their leverage in order to protect the bottom line. There is a payback at that. Um, you know, when interest rates start rising, as indeed um, Silicon Valley Bank found out, um, the whole thing goes into reverse, and very quickly you go bust. And this is a uh, um, how this is going to be dealt with is going to be a very interesting question. I suspect that because um, a primary duty of the central bank is to protect the integrity of the commercial banking system. Uh, that um, the expense of this will be um, uh, shown in, in, in the currency. In effect, uh, the rescue will involve uh, the Fed um, buying uh, government debt so that um, you know, it increases its balance sheet, it increases banks' reserves and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, not only that, but there will have to be rescues, which basically involve the printing of money. That, you know, inevitably. I mean, well, that's printing of money is the way people put it, but it's the other side of of uh, debt purchases by the central bank. It's the other side of QE. The other side of QE is cash chucked into the economy. They're going to have to do something similar to that. Um, you know, with a with a rather diff different angle. Instead of rescuing government finances and keeping interest rates suppressed. Um, it'll all be about keeping interest rates suppressed and rescuing the banking system. Surprise, surprise, the, uh, the banker's bank uh, acts to preserve the banks, not necessarily for the best interests of the ordinary uh, 
uh, re- retiree. Well, it it is. It, it this is a problem. It is in the interest of the ordinary person because they, you know, the number one priority is to protect uh, deposit holders' um, uh, deposits. I, you know, and uh, you know the idea that you can do this with a bail-in, you know, get the bank's um, own creditors, bondholders, and large depositors to bail out the small depositors. I mean, it's just nonsense. That's ne- never going to work. But um, you know, you, you're going to have bailouts. I mean, it's as simple as that. And we had we had this lesson from the great what they call the great financial crisis. I mean, it, it's, it's actually going to be the minor financial crisis compared with the one coming up. Um, uh, and that was when the, the the Fed just literally wrote open checks in effect. Yeah, you know, anyone needs needs help. You know, we we will we will underwrite you. That's really what they did. I reckoned at the time they were. Um, sort of open-ended obligations to the tune of about thirteen trillion dollars. I seem to recall. Well, that was, I mean, enormous. I mean, you know, it's the first time we were really talking about trillions. Now, of course, it's old hat. I remember when it was happening, we were told four hundred billion, and then about a week later, eight hundred billion, and then about a, two years later, we were told, well, actually, it ended up being about sixteen trillion, and the number just keeps going up. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have two questions. Actually, a lot of questions that were submitted by viewers. These two are related. Uh, Sufi Bear 555 says, now that the BIS has publicly distanced itself from the BRICS bridge project, is this creating an either or scenario and even a potentially false binary choice by not considering other options? Related questions from uh, Mr. Booch 526, is the BIS working hand in glove with BRICS or is their relationship more adversarial? If adversarial, do you think we're looking at a hot war or a global depression? Your perspective on the the distancing of the of the BIS from the uh, BRICS um, M Bridge project. Well, um, I, I really think that the BIS has lost the plot. I mean, they, they really have. It's it's really quite extraordinary that you know well they've been sort of banging on with um, CBDCs and um, you know digitization or I don't know digital money or whatever. I mean. Money is already digital. I'm not quite sure what the hell they're talking about. Uh, so um, this this business, I mean, I think what they did with this Embridge thing was uh, they were probably told by, um, let's say, the Fed and you know, the Western Alliance, um, you know, under no circumstances are you going to help the Russians and the Chinese um, compete against us. So you know, you you then get the backing off, um, but. A lot of that is completely unnecessary. I mean, apart from anything else, the whole idea of a new currency has been dropped completely um, for the very simple reason that if you're going to um, drive the dollar out of circulation uh, for trade settlement purposes, you've got to come up with a better currency. And that better currency can only be something which is credibly convertible into gold. It's as simple as that. Related question here from James Pagioli, 1092. For the BRICS countries, is there any downside for them to not buy the U.S. debt for their reserves and only buy gold and silver for their way of de-dollarization? Yeah, I would say there's any upside. This is a short answer. I mean, you know, when you've got a failing, you know, when you've got someone in a debt crisis and the whole thing's failing, and you and and, and it's likely to trigger complete financial chaos, why have anything in it? Uh, you know, just get the hell out. And the only way you get the hell out is to get out of credit and get into real money, which, of course, is gold. And that, that is the message that central banks around the world um, now understand. Uh, you know, they may not admit it, but um, basically that's why uh, most, of the major, m- most of the central banks, and okay, not the major ones, the major ones aren't admitting to anything. They're just keeping very, very quiet. Um, all the you know all the Asian central banks and government funds and you know all these sort of hidden bits, um, they understand completely what's happening to the credibility of the dollar and all the other Western currencies, and so they're getting out. That's that's really um, uh, led to demand for gold, and it's just cleaned us out of any gold liquidity, or it is cleaning us out of any gold liquidity. Help us understand the difference as you see it between the BRICS consortium of countries and their potential proposed trade settlement currency, et cetera, versus the Eurozone, which has been going on now for decades. And you've been 
pretty critical of the stability of its currency as kind of this utopian pipe dream where you're trying to marry incompatible uh, cultures and incompatible uh, levels of productivity and debt uh, habituation, that sort of thing, you know, uh, Germany carrying the load and, and Spain and, and Greece and so on kind of being the profligate uh, spenders and debtors. Uh, will not, is there a different dynamic over there on the side of the BRICS, which is even a larger conglomeration of countries? We have a question on that from Sandra Idu for 3454 says, South Africa is a BRICS member. Its debt is also reaching unsustainable levels. Will the South African rand depreciate in value if it is linked to the new BRICS currency? Well, uh, I mean, the, the new BRICS currency is not going to happen. Forget it. I mean, it really is. Uh, so so um, I think we just dismiss all talk about it. Um, if anything happens, it will be as a result of the collapse of our currencies, the credit, because our currencies are credit. It's, as I, you know, as, as someone said before a congressional com- committee a long time ago, um, you know, the dollar depends on uh, the faith, if you like, that people have in it, the faith and the credit in the U.S. government. So, you know, when that collapses. Um, then there may be a change, and I guess that the change will not be a new BRICS currency, but what it will be, I think, is um, for defensive reasons, China and Russia putting their currencies onto a gold standard. Now, whether they do it properly or not, we'll have to see at the time. I mean, it's, it's very, very simple to do. So <clears throat> I think that's that's the important thing. Now, in terms of um, any comparison between the uh, European Union and BRICS, um, the big difference is that the European Union is a political union, whereas BRICS is in effect a trade union. It's a union based on, on uh, um, if you like, free trade between the members. That's the whole point of it. And principally, um, it's not just free trade, but also um, the recycling of investment to improve the infrastructure in these countries. Uh, to um, allow for the extradition extradition of um, commodities um, and all the rest of it. I mean, for example, the building of a railway from Mombasa on the East African coast all the way through to the Congo is all about shipping out, um, you know, sort of things like cobalt and copper and, you know, all these wonderful things that um, are being discovered in the, in, in, in the Congo. Um, and uh, in return, of course, the Chinese, um, you know, are importing capital in, um, so the you know the currency thing doesn't really matter in a sense. What they're doing is they're importing capital into into places like Kenya, Uganda, Belgian, well, the old Belgian Congo, the Congo, uh, Central African Republic, and so on. Um, the idea basically being that um, by improving communications, by um, opening up the country properly, investing in it, uh, then everybody's going to benefit, including including China. Um, the only country with with a problem in this, I, I guess, really, is Russia, because Russia is a huge net exporter of um, energy in particular and other uh, commodities um, and uh, does not have... Um, imports that match. So she is always having to import other currencies, which, you know, which is the result, if you like, of of, um, of, of her sales of energy in particular. So she's up to her neck in, in Indian rupees, for example. Now, that's not a very happy situation for Russia. And I think that's why Russia is actually quite keen to push the idea of a gold-backed BRICS trade settlement currency um, back in... in uh, August last year, ahead of the Johannesburg summit, um, but that is now a dead duck. Uh, that's not going to happen. If, um, as I say, if anything happens, it will be as a result of the collapse of currencies in the West. I mean, we've the other thing, um, as uh, you know, so to, to respond to um, your listener's question, uh, or viewer's question. Uh, I mean, really, what they're trying to do is they're trying to assemble a parallel world, if you like, to the West, so that um, instead of the IMF and the World Bank, you've got the new development bank, um, which will do similar functions. Um, 
they're planning, and this was announced um, at Kazan, uh, they're planning, uh, uh, you know, new precious metals exchanges, wheat, you know, sort of uh, wheat exchanges. They're looking at other commodity exchanges and all the rest of it. So the idea basically is to build a complete parallel structure so that they don't rely on the West, on Western capital markets to um, sell and acquire commodities and all the rest of it. You've described for us a fairly challenging situation globally, uh, geopolitically and uh, monetarily for some time. We have a question from Bill M. from Florida. Alistair, I see in your comments, both during interviews and online, that you recognize more and more that current negative global conditions may be more planned than by accident. And if so, has your analysis process changed? Um, hmm, planned. I'm not too sure that it has planned, actually, has been planned. And I don't think I've ever sort of taken that view. Um, the, the problems that we have, I think, are really the knock-on effects and uh, responses to earlier problems. It's almost, it's always, I mean, I, you know, I'm a very poor snooker player, but, you know, I've found that um, the way you win, basically, is to not make mistakes or make fewer mistakes than your opponent. Uh, and um, when you look at what our political classes have been doing, they have been making mistakes because they don't understand economics. Same with the central banks. They don't understand economics, really, in spite of the fact that they're stuffed full of PhDs from prestigious universities. But they really don't understand economics. And so when things start going wrong, their response is always to make it worse. And so they go from bad to worse to worse to worse to worse. Now, it's very easy for a conspiracy theorist to conclude that this is so stupid that it must be planned. But it's not. It's just pure, continual incompetence. And that is the view, the view I take on how um, things have, have actually evolved. And if you look, like, look at American foreign policy, I would say it's exactly the same American foreign policy. And the Chinese recognize this. I mean, they don't, um, uh, they don't try and force the pace. Uh, the Chinese sit there and they just, kept, you know, get on with their own business. Um, and uh, every time the Americans try and do something uh, to upset the Chinese, um, it rebounds on the Americans. You know, and this is, as far as, as far as the Chinese are concerned, I mean, they don't, you know, they take the view when someone's making, when your enemy is making all the mistakes, then why interrupt him? <laughs> and that's what they do. They just sit there. You know, and they don't they don't overreact. I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of a reaction. I mean, we saw uh, under Trump, for example, when he really tried to hit them with um, uh, uh, tariffs, there was a sort of response back, but it wasn't actually a very serious response um, uh, because the Chinese are really quite pragmatic about this. I mean, you know, these guys aren't fools. <laughs> Unfortunately, we take them for fools, or at least our leaders do. And uh, we all end up um, paying the cost. Turning back to uh, domestic policy, uh, we have an election tomorrow. And uh, one of the economic advisors to Donald Trump, if he's uh, victorious, Judy Shelton, has been proposing a 50-year gold bond. The question from Ernest Como 4166 says, what would be some of the implications if Judy Shelton's 50-year gold-backed bond were implemented as I understand it, payment to the bondholder could either be in gold or tied to a gold price. Um, I'm not quite sure why she's saying that. I mean, is she saying it because it's a Trojan horse um, to try and get the dollar back onto a gold standard? Because that's the only way in which that proposal makes sense. I mean, you know, if you're going to have a 50-year gold bond, then if the liabilities of covering that from a fiat currency are just um, inconceivable. I mean, they really are just horrendous. So I suppose, um, you know, I haven't really thought about what she said, but um, uh, the only conclusion that, uh, that I can think of um, being put on the spot is that uh, she must be thinking of some sort of way of getting uh, back onto a gold standard because that's ultimately what would have to happen if... America issued a gold bond. But of course, that raises other questions. You know, what, uh, what is America's actual true uh, 
uh, gold reserve position. And it also raises the question, um, you know, sh the New York Fed um, is custodian, what they call earmarked uh, funds, earmarked gold, uh, holding earmarked gold for uh, foreign central banks. And um, we saw when Germany tried to get some of hers back that uh, Houston, there was a problem. Uh, hmm, you know. Uh, is is that really there? Is all that gold really there, etc.? I mean, this is a can of worms as far as America is concerned. Um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I would be tempted if I was Judy Shelt Shelton also to sort of maybe, um, uh, you know, if you like sort of uh, uh, have a slightly impish approach in terms of humor to the whole thing. Oh, because, I mean, I just... The problem America has is that having gone off the gold standard, having denied gold is anything to do with the monetary system, and that the new gold is the dollar full stop, and the whole world is now on a dollar standard. To come back from that in an organized fashion is virtually impossible. And not only that, but you would have to sort out America's finances, because it's completely unsustainable going back on a gold standard with the way things are. We have a question here that's uh, close, near and dear to the hearts of a lot of our viewers and listeners who have been watching closely the performance of silver relative to gold. Astronaut says, can gold, but especially silver, wrestle free of the constant price suppression or shorting and enter new price discovery? Uh, I think the answer is that you'll continue to get that sort of um, market behavior. Uh, so long as we have um, derivatives, derivative markets, whether it's fu futures on COMEX or forwards in London, uh, because that gives huge leverage to people who want to play games with real money. Um, and the thing is that these people playing games, they don't actually understand that gold and silver are real money, you know, by law, by c everybody's common law. Uh, and... Um, you know, they are uh, up to their necks, if you like, in short positions. Uh, they want to retrieve that. Um, they make a lot of money trading it. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a very, very profitable business. Um, so, you know, while you're losing, let us say, in terms of uh, valuation on your net position um, uh, at every quarter or, you know, or every month, if that's the way you account for it, um, you know, the the profits from trading um, should pretty much cover it. But I would say that the short positions that they have now, and and bear in mind that you know rising prices uh, just makes the whole thing worse. Um, I would not be surprised if we have one or two of these players getting into trouble. I mean, you know, we're talking about very very large negative positions on you know on their um, on on their balances, and and you know if. You know, if you're a director of a bank or, let's say, running the Treasury Department of a bank and you're looking at the commitments that you have in these markets, you sort of think, well, you know, if I want to de, you know, uh, de gear my, you know, my balance sheet, that's probably where I've got to go. So th I don't think it's easy for the traders, if you like, in the swaps and then the, you know, the bullion bank traders and all the rest of it. I think they've got themselves into a really difficult position. Uh, still down that channel of uh, whether gold can rise to its true value, uh, Brigitte4825 says, if gold is set to rise to its true value in the future, who would be able to afford it? Will it be a problem for sellers when wanting to buy other undervalued assets? I think there's a problem with the approach there, the idea of gold's true value. Gold's true value in fiat currency is what you see in the market now. Um, and... The other thing I would say is that, you know, if you're expecting the gold price to rise, actually what you're looking at is a fall in the value of, of your fiat currency. That's actually what it's all about. It's not about gold rising. I mean, you've just got to look at the value of gold over the millennia, and you can see that um, the purchasing power of gold actually varies remarkably little over big, you know, spans of time. I mean, if you look at individual things, um, you know, they come and go, um, you know, and, you know, the value can increase substantially or decrease substantially. But if you look at oil, for example, since the 1950, um, 
it was priced in 1950 at $2.53 a barrel. Um, and, uh, it, you know, in terms of gold, um, uh, the price today is actually um, slightly lower in gold. In other words, the value of gold is slightly higher measured in oil uh, from 1950. But at the same time, if you look at it in dollars, it's now $70 a barrel from $2.53, and it has been 140 And it has been very briefly negative, if you remember, when there was a delivery problem in April uh, 2020. Um, so, you know, the volatility is, is, is not in gold. It's actually in the fiat currencies. That's what's happened. It's the purchasing power of fiat currencies, which is going down. And I would say they are now falling at an accelerating rate. And that's the important thing. So when you look at the gold price and you see it rising, it's not gold rising so much. I mean, obviously, there's an element of it, um, you know, rising for whatever. Um, but uh, in the main, it is really your currency going down the swanee. Alistair, you write every week on these topics, and for people who want to stay uh, closely connected with your latest analysis, how should they do so? Um, the the only way to do it now is uh, to subscribe to my Substack, my cloud finance Substack, uh, which is alistairmcleod.substack.com. If you Google it, Google McLeod Finance, you'll probably come across it. And if folks, if you don't want to miss a single episode with Alistair or any of our other guests, make sure you're on our free mailing list. Just go to libertyandfinance.com, put your email address in, click submit, make sure you confirm. On the confirming email, you'll get one email in your inbox per day with our latest interviews and calling, including all of our interviews with Alistair and any weekly specials. And uh, as always, Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers and subscribers, thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. That's very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, DK. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for October 28th through November 4th, 2024, while supplies last. This week we feature gold half-ounce backdated Canadian maples at just $110 over melt. We also have backdated silver one-ounce Britannia at just $2.99 over spot per ounce. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.